Uh, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, and thanks Tony, Lexi, and SF Scala, Bay Area Machine Learning for organizing, of course, Yammer for hosting, uh, and everyone for coming, um, despite the lack of food. But hopefully it will be well worth it. <laughs> uh, and apologies for this column. Um, hopefully you can still hear and see the slides. So this is about decision trees on Spark. And for those who are machine learning experts, what I hope you'll get is a bit more knowledge about doing machine learning in a distributed setting, uh, especially using Spark and Scala. And for those who are experts in Spark and distributed computing, uh, hopefully you'll get a bit about uh, using an example machine learning algorithm uh, decision trees and how that interacts with distributed computing. And for everyone, I really hope this will be useful in terms of basically understanding how to use uh, Spark and uh, the machine learning library built on top of it, MLlib, uh, to do big machine learning. So I'll start just giving a bit of background on decision trees. Uh, I'll start with a much loved example, spam detection. So say I get an email, you know, get Viagra real cheap, send money now to get. The way we're going to look at this on a computer is to parse this into um, a more friendly representation. And one really simple one is word counts. So here there are two instances of the word get, uh, one instance of the word Viagra, and so on. And you might have other types of data you'd include to represent this email. Uh, for example, do you know the address of the sender, address known? And each of these elements is going to be called a feature, which basically says uh, some descriptor uh, about this email. And then this entire vector of features, uh, I'm going to call an instance or an example. So our goal with the decision trees and uh, other machine learning models for prediction is to take an instance, examine this feature vector, and predict a label, where in this case, the labels are either not spam or spam. So given this sort of high-level goal, uh, how does a decision tree model actually uh, do this prediction? So we're given an instance of an email in the form of this feature vector. And a very simple decision tree might be something like this. Uh, we start at the top node, and this is going to test the value of a particular feature. Is the address known? In this case, uh, it's not, and so we're going to go to the right, uh, the edge labeled with no. Uh, then we count how many times does the word Viagra appear. Well, it appears more than zero times, so we're going to go to the right, and finally, we'll get to this leaf node, which is going to say, uh, we finish predicting, we're going to predict the label spam. And so just to put some terminology up there, uh, these boxed internal nodes, internal tree nodes, are going to test a single feature value. And uh, these bottommost leaf nodes are going to predict labels. So this is a really simple, dumb example, but it gives you a sense of the power of these models. They can handle different types of features. Here we have a categorical feature, uh, address known, takes two values, uh, and continuous features, counts of words. It can handle different types of labels. Here we have two categories, uh, and so it's a classification problem. You can also predict continuous values, uh, in which case you call it regression. Decision trees are pretty interpretable models where you can trace down the tree and sort of see the exact process which led to that decision, that prediction. And models are pretty flexible. They can be small, in which case they're very simple, or big trees, in which case they're expressive, powerful. And yeah, I just want to emphasize that these really are uh, industry workhorses or parts of industry workhorses. Lots of applications. Here, silly example with spam detection. Later on, I'll do a little demo with digit recognition. Uh, other famous examples include, for example, the winners of uh, the Netflix uh, grand prize for movie recommendation included decision trees as part of their model. So let me look at the outline. First, we're going to start with quick overviews of decision trees and Spark. And the point will be to show how traditional methods for learning trees 
don't distribute that well. We'll then talk about how learning trees actually works on Spark. And this will give you an intuition for that underlying computation, communication, and the constraints you're working under in the distributed setting. I'll then move to using MLlib in practice, and in particular, show a couple demos to highlight issues like model selection and accuracy communication trade-offs. And finally, I'll mention some active development. So decision trees in Spark. Let's first talk about how you might learn a decision tree if you're working with a single compute node. You have this training data set where each of these rows is a training instance with its label. And just for visualization, I'm going like, to collect all these training instances at the top. And what you're going to do when you're learning a tree is pick a feature and value to test in order to split this data set where, for each instance, that instance is either going to go down the left path or the right path. So we'll partition the data set. And see, intuitively, what you want to do is group all the non-spam on one side, all the spam on the other. And in this case, on the left-hand side, we have a bunch of not spam. So we'll make that a leaf node and say we'll predict not spam if an instance goes there. And then on the right-hand side, it was a bit muddled, so we'll split further, testing another feature. And you know, eventually, we may say it's good enough. We're going to do these predictions at the leaf nodes. The key point in terms of computation, what you're doing with your data, is that you're recursively partitioning the training instances based on what feature uh, and split you choose. And you might start to see what the problem is when we start talking about how you might distribute your data. So in a lot of big machine learning problems, you have tons of instances. And so it makes sense to partition by rows or the training instances. So each worker will have some subset of this data. Well, if you compare this to what we were just looking at in terms of a tree recursively partitioning data to the left and right, uh, you can see the issue. When you start out learning, you put your data on your nodes, but you don't know how the uh, splits are going to partition your data as you learn. So for example, with this, you'd expect each worker to have some data points which should go to the left, some which should go to the right. And then on the next iteration, um, a naive implementation of that traditional algorithm would try to collect all the instances which go to the left onto one group of machines and so on. So basically, you'd end up shuffling the entire data set across the network many times. Of course, we're not really going to do this. And so what I'd like to do is give a brief overview of Spark and the sort of computational framework which is available and will let us get around this naive implementation. So Spark, uh, at a high level, is a fast and general engine for large-scale data processing. It uh, came out of UC Berkeley's AMP Lab, and it has a really big open source community. It's one of the fastest growing uh, Apache projects, 250-plus um, developers from lots of companies, and it's included in every major Hadoop distribution now. So Spark is sort of this underlying uh, framework for large-scale data processing in a distributed fashion. But built on top of it are a number of libraries um, for SQL, for streaming, machine learning, uh, graph processing. I'm just going to have time to talk about one of these, the machine learning library. Uh, and within that, I'll note, there are a bunch of types of algorithms implemented, uh, classification, regression, recommendation, you know, things like movies, uh, clustering, statistics, linear algebra, and so on. Decision trees will be applicable to these first two tasks, like we mentioned before. So Spark is sort of this general framework, uh, but I'd like to delve into a bit about the data representation used by Spark. Uh, it uses what are called resilient distributed data sets, or RDDs. Uh, which basically take the form uh, we were just looking at, where each worker is going to have some set of partitions. Each of these partitions is going to have some subset of the rows or training instances. And then Spark will have a driver or master node, uh, which can sort of 
aggregate information from these different workers, communicate with them, uh, and handle the coordination. So just to give a sense of the types of computations which can be done with RDDs, uh, one very common one is a map. We take each of these instances and we're going to transform it into some other representation. Uh, for example, you just saw with an email example, could take a raw text email and transform it into a feature vector. The other important operation uh, is an aggregation. On each node, you can compute uh, some statistics or other information about the data you have there, uh, and then you can aggregate these to the driver node. I'll finally mention one of the big pluses of using Spark, as opposed to maybe traditional MapReduce, is iterative computation, which of course is very common in ML. Uh, so say we have our RDD like this. We may want to aggregate some statistics, which is what we'll do with decision trees may want to communicate some function of those back to all the workers uh, and iterate like this. And so the big advantage of RDDs is that a lot of this computation is maintained in memory rather than writing to and reading from disk on every iteration. Uh, RDDs, of course, are also, um, the R is for resilient, and so they have built in a lot of failure tolerance, uh, which is great for machine learning people like myself not to have to worry about uh, these details of distributed computation. So that gives sort of a very high level of traditional learning of decision trees, uh, Spark, and we'll lead into discussing a bit more of how we actually have implemented this in Spark. So at a high level, we're going to train trees sort of level by level. Starting with the top node, we'll choose what feature to split on, and then we'll recurse. Uh, we now have two nodes to uh, examine, and we'll train features to split on for each of those, and so on. Now at each of these steps, the key choice is how do we split at that node? What feature do we use, and maybe what value do we uh, choose for going left versus going right? So recalling our spam example, uh, we want to choose this feature to test. Here we have a binary feature, true or false, and we need to ask the question, how good is this split? And this will let us compare different features, different splits, and choose a best one. So what do we really need to know uh, about this? Well, basically, intuitively, we need to know the number of not spam instances which go to the left, uh, spam ones which go to the left, and same for the right. And basically, this will let us say, if a lot of spam instances go one way, a lot of not spam go the other way, it's a good split. We'll call these the sufficient statistics for this split. And these will allow us to compute what's called the impurity, or information gain, uh, which is basically a function taking these sufficient statistics and giving you a real value indicating how good this split is. And note that I'm saying this is, uh, I won't go into details about impurity, but it, it, it can be sort of a general function because you could have different trade-offs, especially when you get into things like multi-class classification, where even with binary classification, with two labels, you could ask yourself, is it better to have a uh, left-hand side with all not spam and the right-hand side very mixed, or to have both uh, a bit less mixed, uh, but neither side perfect. So there are various trade-offs sort of set by this impurity. I'll go give an example of uh, how this behaves in practice later on. But basically, you can see that in order to grade the split, say how good it is, we just need these sufficient statistics. We don't need to know everything about, we don't need to know something about every training instance on that driver node. So we're going to use this aggregation mechanism in Spark where all of the worker nodes have some set of training instances. They compute stats about the various splits. And then once we add all of these together, the driver node has enough information in order to choose the best split. So returning to that high level view, training level by level, on the first level, we need to choose a split for this one node. So as we just said, we aggregate some statistics. Driver node picks the best split. 
and tells all the workers what it just chose. Uh, then on the next iteration, we do the same thing. Gather statistics about now two nodes. Uh, driver node can make a decision, and so on. And the key point here is that we're only making uh, one pass over the data per level. And this means that uh, for fixed depth tree, the running time is going to scale linearly with the data set size. And this is what you might hope for with an ML problem uh, and actually works out in practice as well. So to illustrate that, here's a little example of binary classification. Uh, There's a 16 node EC2 cluster uh, training trees with six levels. Here on the x-axis, I'm showing the number of features uh, in the data sets. And on the y-axis, the time uh, to train in seconds. Uh, the number of instances um, is fixed for each of these plot lines. And you can see it's varying from 16,000 to uh, some 8 million. But the main point is that these lines are straight. So running time is scaling linearly with the number of features, or in other words, with the data set size. Uh, up here, for example, it's a pretty big data set, uh, 224 gigabytes at the top. You can see similar behavior in terms of scaling the number of instances. Here it's the same sort of plot, except that now the x-axis is increasing number of training instances up to 8 million. And again, you can see that the running time is scaling linearly with the number of instances, i.e. the data set size. Good, so works out in practice. And this gives kind of a high level view of how trees, yes? Um, do you have to sort of randomize the data in a special way? I'm not sure like what if one of those workers right. suggests one thing is a split, uh, right. the other one doesn't, how does it aggregate? So the question was, do you have to randomize data in a particular way? You know, what if a worker gets an odd subset of the data? And with decision trees, um, rough answer is no. Um, it's deterministic. Um, more accurately, there actually is a point when you're using continuous features uh, where we do do sampling, and I'll explain that later on. And there, it doesn't matter how your data are partitioned, but it's not deterministic. Um, so it's fine if you have you know, weird data on one node and normal data on another. Um, Good. Yeah, and do feel free to interrupt me and you know, ask questions. That would be great. So now I'll take a look at using MLlib and decision trees there in practice. Uh, in particular, model selection and this accuracy communication trade-offs you can tune. So I said in practice, so here's uh, one part of the API for decision tree. Uh, we have a train classifier function, which takes uh, a number of values, which I'll sort of use as an outline. Uh, the first three are really quick, basically describing your data. Uh, we have an input data set, which is an RDD of these labeled points, the feature vector and the label. Number of classes, which you need to predict. This is a classification problem, so we need to know the number of categories the label can take. There's this categorical features info, which is sort of this metadata allowing you to specify which features are categorical, which are continuous. And uh, while decision tree will run if you don't uh, really input this data, um, it can help the algorithm really know how to handle features properly. Now we come to the more interesting ones. Uh, so we'd mentioned impurity before, which is this function taking these sufficient statistics and telling you how good a split is. Uh, the other interesting one, um, is the max depth, which, I, I'm sorry, say again, please. Oh, right. So the impurity is a string here uh, because we like to use uh, simple types. So Spark supports uh, Scala, Python, Java APIs, and the original decision tree implementation actually had a specialized class. Uh, which you would um, use to specify the impurity. Uh, the issue with that is that made it a little more difficult to interact between, uh, for example, to do the Python API. Um, and so using simple types makes it a lot easier. 
Right. So there are very common sort of named impurity functions, uh, Gini, entropy, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, say again? Right. So this could definitely be implemented via some kind of enumeration. Um, we made this design decision, yeah, basically by looking at other uh, very popular machine learning libraries um, and thinking about what would work best in terms of uh, having these three different APIs. But yeah, I agree, there are different, a variety of choices you could do. Um, for max depth, this is the maximum number of levels in the tree. Um, it's a really important parameter because basically the more levels you have, the more expressive or powerful this model is, but also the more expensive it'll be to train. Uh, so what I'd like to do, hopefully I can manage uh, with one hand, um, is a little demo uh, looking at the max depth and impurity parameters. So, Yes, yeah, so there is that last parameter, max bends. That will come later. Yeah, I will discuss that. Uh, so good. Um, one sec, it looks like I need to, I, I think unplugging my um, thing from the projector messed with settings a little. Um, good. OK, so what I'm showing here, and please tell me in back if you can't read this very well, but I know there's screens back there, um, is uh, a window looking at uh, the Databricks cloud, which is basically letting me run Spark uh, on a cluster here, which I have uh, this notebook attached to. And basically, I want to show you like a simple example to show how to train trees and give a sense of intuition about the behavior and how to uh, set these various parameters. Good. So um, I'm uh, not great at typing with one hand, so I'm going to uh, just copy some stuff in. Um, what we're going to do, oh, uh, that would be awesome. Thank you. <laughs> great. Uh, thank you. Um, OK, so we're going to be looking at uh, choosing the number of bends and the impurity. And we're going to start with uh, loading some data. And what this data is is this very common MNIST handwritten digit recognition data set. Um, and the way we're going to do it is we have a couple files in S3. Um, these are being loaded. and uh, it's a training set, a test set. And I'm actually, if you look carefully at the file names, I'm inverting them so that actually we have a, uh, a lot more uh, test examples. And to count those, we now have two RDDs, um, which have a training data set, a test data set. And you can see they have, um, huh, they're not inverted, sorry. Uh, 60 and 10,000 examples, respectively. Uh, so as I said, this is a handwritten digit recognition data set. Uh, so this is what the data looks like. The label here is the first value, uh, in this case a five. And then you have a very long feature vector, which are basically pixel values, pixel intensity values. Um, so just to give you a sense of what this actually looks like, Here's an example image uh, of a four from this data set. And you can see it's clearly recognizable uh, to us. Uh, there's definitely harder examples, but um, it's sort of a rough grayscale image. So now what I want to do is train some decision trees using varying max depth values and uh, impurity settings. And yes, these are these like Gini entropy impurities, which are very standard. Uh, implemented by most uh, popular decision tree um, uh, decision tree libraries out there, and basically, I want to give a sense of how uh, these various parameter settings 
are um, going to end up affecting that held out data test error. So what I'm doing here is running uh, some commands where each is going to take um, a set of max depth values, uh, and it's going to map each of those into a decision tree train classifier call. You can see these parameters we were looking at before. Uh, we're training, um, I guess, 16 trees, uh, each with different max depth, uh, different impurity, and we have 10 classes, uh, the 10 digits, uh, which we want to recognize. So this is going through uh, the data sets, uh, training each of these in sequence. And while it's running, I just want to define a helper function, uh, which is this accuracy. And it's going to take a model uh, and output a double, which is the accuracy on this MNIST test data set. So while that's the machine running, um, I'll also mention that for the sake of nicety later on, I'll define a little case class, which will put the accuracies into um, classes holding the depth, impurity, and the accuracy. Good. So uh, this command up at the top finished running. And just to give a sense of what this did, uh, you can see we were training on a series of depth parameters. Uh, depth zero means we predict a single value. I guess one is the most common label, so we're just predicting that. Um, depth one means one internal node, so we're testing one feature value, and there are two possible outputs, and so on. So now, Yeah, the features are individual pixels. And I agree this is just like a simple example where, you know, you could do fancy stuff with uh, hog value, uh, uh, features or whatever, but yeah. Um, so we're going to use this uh, accuracy class. And now we're going to compute uh, a variety of the accuracies, one for each of these trees we just learned. Good. So now they're displayed as a table. Uh, but what I'm going to do is uh, mess around a little bit and plot it so it's much more interpretable. What is this interface, Joseph? Um, so this interface is in the, <laughs> shoot. Um, uh, this interface is in the Databricks cloud. I'm unfortunately running on a test cluster, which other people may be messing with. Um, uh, good. But after a little fiddling. Um, now have a plot which shows on the x-axis increasing max depth. Uh, the y-axis, you can see, um, is test accuracy. And you can see, basically, as the trees are getting deeper, they're becoming more expressive, able to model the data more accurately. And therefore, we're doing better uh, in terms of test accuracy. You can see, in terms of the two impurity values for, or, or impurity functions, for this problem, they don't actually matter that much. Uh, both are doing pretty well. Good. So returning to um, uh, this, we have just talked about impurity and max depth and how those tend to affect learning and practice. Um, now I'd like to just mention max bends. And I think this is a particularly interesting case where uh, it gives you the power to tune this communication accuracy trade-off. Sorry, I can take oh, no, no worries. Thanks so much. <laughs> um, good. So in terms of choosing how to split, uh, recall that with this binary feature, 
we, it can take value true or false, and we split either left or right. And for computing how good this split is, we have this one bin, uh, what I'll call a bin, on the left of sufficient statistics for the group of instances which fall to the left, and one bin for those which fall to the right. So I'll call this two bins of sufficient statistics per feature. Uh, but now, of course, you might wonder, what do you do if you have a continuous feature? Uh, for a continuous feature, a split is going to look like a test on this number line of whether or not the feature value is less than some fixed value here. So what this will look like in terms of binning is your training data is going to fall on this number line, some to the left of this cut, some to the right, and this partition is going to create two bins where to know how good this particular split is, you need to have counts for the left and counts for the right. Of course, you can see the issue where if you have a lot of training instances, you could potentially split this continuous feature between every consecutive pair of values. So you'd end up having tons and tons of bins. So a naive implementation would have a number of bins on the order of the number of training instances. Uh, but what we do, and is a common and effective solution, is to discretize the data. So you can imagine we have this number line, training instances lie along it, and we could a priori choose to chop this up into big chunks. And in MLlib, this is done by taking a sample of the data so that it's efficient, uh, but somewhat data adaptive. And then we could consider doing a split uh, at each of these cutting lines. In this case, in order to compute how good each of those splits is, we basically need counts from every region between the lines. Here, we have five possible bins. And you can see, of course, this is uh, much smaller than the number of instances and gives us a sort of trade-off where the more bins we allow, uh, the maximum number of cuts, uh, the more like we are to considering every possible cut between instances, and so potentially we'll be more accurate. But if it's smaller number of bins, uh, we'll do less in terms of communicating these sufficient statistics. So in terms of communication, how much is there? Well, on each iteration, we train one level of the tree. So for each tree node, for each feature, and for each bin for that feature, we need a set of sufficient statistics. So the total number is number of nodes times number of features times number of bins per feature. And so the really tunable parameter here is this last one, which we set using the max bins parameter. So this will let us sort of throttle communication, potentially at the expense of accuracy. Uh, thankfully, the expense is often not that great. And for some problems, you know, it doesn't even matter. And what I'd like to do is uh, first mention why communication is so important, and then show why we can throttle it with this max bins. So what we're looking at here is the Spark web UI, which is giving sort of the status of a bunch of jobs which have run in Spark as part of learning a decision tree. Here it's two million instances, few thousand features, uh, about 70 bins per feature. And so I don't expect you to be able to read this, but zooming in on, on a particular part on the early stages of learning, uh, we can see a number of operations happening. There's the reduce, map, those operations we discussed at the beginning. Uh, those are happening quite quickly at the beginning, um, less than a second. And you can see that the data input is about 26 gigabytes. And the interesting columns are to the right, where you can see on this first iteration, where we're training one node, uh, we're communicating about six megabytes. And of course, that's really small because we're doing this thing of aggregating sufficient statistics instead of communicating stuff about all of the data. But you can see as we move up into the second iteration, we're training two nodes. We have twice as many stats to communicate. And so the communication is increasing. Uh, 10 megabytes is small, but moving down to, I feel, I think this is like the sixth or seventh level, I forget. Um, you can see that we're having to communicate a lot more statistics. Here, 200 megabytes. 
And although this is still happening pretty quickly and is much smaller than the total data size, you can imagine what happens when you uh, get much deeper in the tree. So this kind of emphasizes how it is important to keep this communication in place, in mind. And one way of uh, adjusting it is through this max bends parameter. So what I'd like to do again, if I uh, could enlist your help again, <laughs> would it work for you to stand this side? So I can kind of, yeah, okay, side. yeah, yeah no, sure, thanks, sure. good, uh, great. Is just a quick demo to um, continue on with the same data set uh, of how adjusting max bends actually affects accuracy. So uh, again, what I'm going to be doing is um, oops, <laughs> said I was bad at typing. Um, we're going to set the max bends parameter to a set of values from 2 to 32. Uh, 32, I believe, is actually the default in MLlib. Um, but this will show you some extremes and train trees for each one. Um, and this training trees is going to take the same kind of format you saw before. We have an array of max spins values, and we're mapping them to uh, basically a bunch of decision trees, which we're going to train, this time just using one impurity. And here we're training out to max step five. Um, last time we went uh, for a whole range of depths, but this will let us sort of slice it and look at the effect of max bends. And so uh, once, this, once this is done, uh, I'll be able to take a look at, for each of these max spins values, um, the accuracy of the decision tree, which uses that amount of communication. Uh, and then we can take a look at how that actually looks in practice. Um, and so what I'd like to emphasize is that this is a particular data set. And so this is a parameter which may actually vary in behavior for other data sets and, of course, will require some kind of model selection. Um, but what I think this does sort of illustrate is that for a lot of data sets, it's actually pretty robust. Uh, so we computed the test accuracy. And again, I'll want to mess with this a little bit and uh, basically say, um, Good. Um, for a variety of values of uh, max bends from 2 uh, to 32, uh, we have test accuracy on the y-axis. And basically, they're all getting the same test accuracy. And so the thing to note here is that this is Hanrein digit recognition, uh, very simple models, uh, just down to depth 5, um, but that Basically, it's saying that looking at a black and white image in this case um, is doing uh, pretty well compared to looking at grayscale. And of course, real implementations of uh, on MNIST data are really going to uh, use much more expressive models and um, uh, take a bit while longer to train. But this gives you an example of how actually throttling communication doesn't hurt you that much on this data. So going back to, thanks a lot. Uh, yes. Right. So the question is, are we going to see a graph with communication bandwidth used? Um, unfortunately, I don't have a graph available for that. Although the um, Charts we are looking at before in the web UI, uh, we're looking at the total communication from each round. And it is very predictable where for a fixed number of max bends, um, if you double that number of max bends, you're going to end up communicating uh, potentially about twice as much data. And I say potentially because it could depend on your type of features. Um, you know, if you have uh, binary features, you only need two bends, even though 
uh, even if you set max spins much higher. And so um, the current Spark master actually can vary uh, the number of bins per feature. Oh, thank you. Right. So how do you do that? Good. So the question is, how do you actually choose this cutoff for binning in terms of how do you choose the number of the max bins? Or how do you choose the places you slice for binning? I see. Right, right. So it, I said it uh, is somewhat data adaptive. And by that, I meant that what we do is we take a sample of the data. And that lets us sort of get a rough view of what it looks like. and uh, we sort that small sample uh, on the driver node and then uh, basically chop it up. And that means that it's, it'll likely adjust to the various ranges, although it is a sample. Do you, yeah. do you do the sample um, taking it only from one node or from the The sample's taken uh, from every node, and it's basically taking sort of like a fixed fraction from every node, aggregating to the driver. Yeah. Uh, which is what I was mentioning about um, the algorithm not being deterministic, uh, but you not having to worry about having weird data on one node, things like that. Yes? Okay, another question. So related to the aggregation pattern, you, you mentioned that you have a folder worker communicating to the driver. Uh, do you actually implement it this way, or is a tree, tree yes. a logarithmic factor? Right. That's a good question. The question is, yeah, is it all the workers just communicate to the driver, or is there some kind of tree? And uh, if you used Spark 1.0, um, it was basically just sending it to the driver. Uh, there's a tree aggregate function which was implemented and is now being used in decision trees. So the current decision tree actually does use this nice tree. Yeah. Yes. Um, Starting example with like the email thing, you talked about having like text features. Um, is there a way to actually turn text features into sparse labeled points? Um, because I tried to do that, and it ran out of memory in the train phase because it was trying to turn it into a dense vector. Right. So that's a good question. The question was, um, and this is specific to decision trees. Is that right? OK, I, so with naive Bayes, I would not have expected that to happen. Uh, it should support sparsity, but uh, could definitely discuss particulars offline. Decision tree, unfortunately, does not yet uh, really take advantage of sparsity in the labeled point. You can give it a sparse vector, but uh, it's not going to um, actually take advantage of that yet. Uh, definitely something which will be great to include. Um, naive base, I'm surprised, and maybe it was, yeah, just like a, a slight misuse or something. Okay. Yeah, it would be great to discuss later. Any other questions? Yes. You typically train something like a, you know, an example of trees, because trees are the best part. Nobody really expects right. the model in the in real world. Uh, do you guys work with like, you know, just trees or right. in the forest? And so the question was, yeah, uh, trees are great, but yeah, in practice, you normally don't train just one tree and expect it to be a perfect model. You do some kind of bagging or boosting. Um, and the answer is that there's currently, uh, I'll, I'll discuss this a bit more later. Um, they're like on the verge of being in MLlib, but um, and there are existing projects on Spark uh, with code available for that. Um, the current 1.1 release does not have ensembles, but it's like on the verge. Yes. Yeah. Ask a follow-up question: uh, If you're working down that path, why concentrate on performance of training a single tree while we could probably have easier time realizing training a single tree? Yeah, so the question is why focus on single tree performance when you could focus on like training a bunch of trees in parallel. And I think that there, it, it depends on which 
type of ensemble you're learning. So for those not familiar, there are generally two ways you're going to combine trees. Either bagging, where you can basically train trees in parallel on sort of bootstrap or subsamples of your data and then average the results, or boosting, which is very sequential. Train one tree, sort of reweight your data, train another tree. And so I think for bagging, you're right. Um, and while there are ways in which the current optimizations and decision trees are going to help with bagging, um, you could certainly do a lot uh, of other sort of orthogonal optimizations with bagging. For boosting, where it's very sequential, uh, it's definitely going to be important. Yeah. Um, yeah. But definitely upcoming. So in practice, I just like to review. We've mentioned max depth can be important to tune based on held out data, model selection. Uh, there's this max bends, which is good to set low in general, but increase if needed. I did not mention the number of RDD partitions. And for those familiar with Spark, this actually is something which differs from some other types of jobs on Spark, where it's often good to sort of over partition your data and have more partitions of your data than you have compute cores. And the reason for that is if your jobs take different amounts of time, over partitioning can actually sort of help balance that out and make sure all the workers are putting in equals, roughly equal amounts of effort. For machine learning, and in particular decision trees, tasks take about the same amount of time, very uniform. And so it actually is significantly faster often if you set RDD partitions equal to number of compute cores. So MLlib supports a lot of things. Uh, classification with binary and as of uh, Spark 1.1, multi-class labels, uh, regression with continuous labels, different types of features, binary, K category, continuous, uh, various impurity measures and other settings that we've seen, and also as of 1.1, Python, Scala, and Java APIs. There's a lot of ongoing, there are a lot of ongoing improvements, uh, I guess some of which I touched on earlier. And going from Spark 1.0 when decision trees were introduced to 1.1, um, just to give you a rough flavor, here again, 16 node cluster, fixed 3,500 features. Here I'm plotting on the x-axis the number of instances and the y-axis training time. Uh, so the original implementation, uh, you know, ran, I guess, reasonably quickly. Here actually, uh, for 1.1, it's being cut down to almost four or five times faster for these data sets. Uh, likewise, if we fix the number of instances, um, here, we're varying on the x-axis number of features. Uh, version 1.1, you know, ran, I guess, reasonably quickly. And now with one, uh, sorry, 1.0, moving to 1.1 a lot faster. Uh, so there are definitely ongoing performance improvements and even more on the way. I'd like, yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, Mix of terminology. So by 16 node EC2 cluster, yeah, I mean worker nodes. Um, for 2 million instances, I mean training instances or examples, yeah, rows in your data. Too many overloaded terms. Uh, yeah, so like we were just mentioning, there are ensembles, both random forest, this bagging, uh, and boosting on their way. Uh, there's all, a PR currently out there for random forests. Uh, there's an existing implementation on Spark from Alpine Labs called Sequoia Forests, which actually uh, is a great implementation, and we're coordinating merging some of those optimizations into MLlib. Uh, and boosting is under development. Uh, there are model selection pipelines underway, where uh, currently under design, but uh, planned to be in MLlib soon. And this is uh, going to make it a lot easier to do that sort of tuning of these parameters, uh, which we are doing by hand uh, in the Databricks cloud. And some more internal optimizations. So in terms of where to go from here, a good place to start is the Spark project page. Uh, you can download it, try it out locally or on a cluster. Uh, there are videos, exercises, documentation. 
And of course, you can start contributing via GitHub. Uh, you can also check out the Databricks website, where you can learn about Databricks Cloud. Uh, I gave a quick demo of it earlier, and some Spark training resources. Yes? Um, I'm quite interested about the performance test, the graph of the performance test that you showed us just now. Um, could you please? Um, um, uh, sure. Yes. Yes. So, was that performance test conducted with with the assumption that that the type of EC2 instances are of the same type? What kind of EC2 Right, so these, in, in this case, yeah, I ran these uh, using our 3.2x large ones, and um, they were the same type across all these tests, um, because it was run on the same cluster. Um, in terms of, if you're asking about like performance, if you had a mix of types, uh, that's definitely interesting. I personally, unfortunately, have not tried trees on a cluster like that. Yeah. That was my next question. I see. Would, would, you, would, there be poten would you potentially see a different result if you mix different types of EC2 instances? Right. I think the main thing there would be that then what I said about jobs taking very uniform uh, amounts of time would not be correct anymore. And there it would make sense to over partition a bit uh, in order to sort of even out. Um, you know, the slow instances and fast ones, and do a bit more work on the fast ones. More yeah. Questions. So, um, after all, Apache uh, Sparks works well with in-memory computation, yes? Sure. So, will you see much improvement if you use uh, lesser, uh, lesser of uh, medium range EC2 instances, but uh, you, you would rather stick with HS1, because after all, HS1 is fiber. Anyway. Right, so you're asking about like, is it worth it to uh, have like maybe mem Right. Um, so I, I think it may depend on the type of problem, especially. You know, of course, uh, this has a particular set of constraints in terms of how much memory it needs, how much communication. Um, I feel like it would sort of partly depend on the type of problem you're running and what its main bottleneck is. Uh, certainly having memory optimized uh, nodes can be very helpful. Yes? Um, what if um, those instances are scattered across regions? As in, you have some instances oh, in East and some instances in West. I think that, in general, for any platform, that would be an expensive way to run things if you're communicating across the country. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I believe it could be done. I think it would be wise not to. Um, yeah. Great, thanks. Yes? The training times? Uh, right, so it's after loading the data. And loading the data in general is a small fraction of the time. Um, you know, it depends on the algorithm you're running, but with trees, yeah. Um, right, yeah, so didn't, does not include data loading. Great. Yeah, so that about wraps it up, uh, about on time, I think. And uh, basically, I'd like to leave a summary up here and thank the many collaborators who have put a lot of effort into this project. Um, and in particular, all these people and more have put effort into decision trees on Spark. Um, I'd like to thank Tony, Alexi, and uh, Scala, and Barry, uh, ML, uh, again, and Yammer uh, for hosting us here. Uh, we'll certainly like to take other questions and I'd really like to thank you, the audience, for sitting through this without food, uh, pizza to munch on during it. Thanks. <laughs> yes. The SML slide that Spark, uh, Spark things like location sensitive hashing and algorithms like that that are emerging as very powerful right. classification tools. 
Um, so your, the question, I believe, was what kind of support is there for, for example, lo locality-sensitive hashing? And um, I'm actually not too, uh, I, I'm not sure if it is there yet, but I believe it's definitely something which, like, yeah, I agree, is important. And uh, you know, we're always welcoming uh, contributions to the project. Um, I, I don't know of an ETA or anything on that. Right. Uh, so, right. I'm not super qualified to talk about uh, Spark certification, which the question was about. Um, one part of your question, does it involve machine learning? Uh, I know that it does touch on MLlib, um, but I would definitely, I guess for that, I'd recommend going to the website. I know there's info there, but I I'm not really involved with that. Yeah. Uh, so, I, in the middle. Right. As not in terms of single trees or ensembles, but like a platform picture, like how do we right. say a model with a single additional training record? Right. As opposed to including the model with CDS or Is that as a platform feature uh, it's about today? Or, or is it, where, where is that going? Right. So the question was is there a platform feature for uh, basically, incremental model building, your data is coming in as a stream, say, and uh, you're updating your model as you go. Uh, so it's definitely under active development. I know that there are streaming implementations of certain algorithms as sort of a more general machine learning framework. Uh, this thing I vaguely hinted at of uh, machine learning pipelines and a design doc being on JIRA for a discussion. Um, is definitely part of like sort of a big effort to update the API, include sort of frameworks for it to make it more generally easy to do things like that. Um, so I think it's sort of algorithm specific right now, but hopefully will be more general soon. Yeah. Any algorithm that is currently in there where we can look at how streaming is used? Right. So. I haven't worked with the streaming part myself, pretty new to Databricks, but um, can I field a question? To, uh, <laughs> if I may. Uh, so uh, this is Xiang Rui, who has uh, been on MLlib for a bit longer. So we talk about streaming algorithms. One is implemented in MLlib, is streaming linear regression. You can specify a stream of vectors and it will keep improving your uh, model, current model, and make predictions on the fly. And the other one we have is uh, streaming k-means. And it's uh, in discussion and we have uh, initial implementation and I think it will be merged in the next release. And basically you have uh, initial uh, clustering model and then you can just uh, for the incoming data, you can update your cluster and at the same time you try to apply a decay vector on existing Knows and then so you can always capture the current trend. Now we will try to add more streaming algorithm like something like A/B testing and for the online model evaluation. It's a uh, a lot of things are coming. Uh, so I I feel like you had it up first and then I'll come to you. So, so yeah. Yeah, so, Oh sorry. Oh yeah, maybe you first. Yes. Okay. So you showed me the um, um, improvements from version 1.0 to 1.1 1 .1 in right. the um, uh, performance of um, calculation. Is there like improvements um, going on for like memory footprint? Yeah. So the question was, how, what kind of improvements are there for memory footprint? I think there are two areas where uh, you could have improvements. One is the sufficient statistics being smaller. Um, and the other is the data set being smaller. So for the statistics, uh, there have been actually, and the current Spark Master is more efficient there than 1.1, um, where basically it's better about 
um, using an adaptive number of bins. For compressing the data set itself, uh, that's something which um, is currently in JIRA form, but hopefully will be in there before long, yeah. Um, communicating data, though, sorry, I should add, um, there is some underlying compression which happens with Spark, um, which, uh, yeah, definitely reduces that sometimes. Uh, so I think I'd said next. Do you have any comment on uh, competitive other Right, so as far as comparisons with other libraries, um, so there are uh, definitely some I've run. Unfortunately, <laughs> I, I don't have plots here. Uh, there will be a blog post on the Databricks website uh, before too long about decision trees. Um, and actually, I take that back. If you look back, I believe there are talks listed there, which do some comparisons with other libraries, like uh, maybe scikit-learn. Um, I think that there are, it's a bit difficult to do sort of distributed comparisons, because I don't know of a lot of distributed implementations of decision trees. Yeah. Sorry, so if you look up, uh, I believe from the Spark Summit, um, there was a talk on decision trees, which included, I, I believe it included some comparisons. That'd be the easiest one to get. Uh, do you know if there is support or flex support for CUDA on GPU clusters? So the question is support for CUDA on GPU clusters. Um, there is not, as far as I know right now. Uh, I agree, like, supporting GPUs could be very valuable. Um, currently, yeah, I, I don't know of on, ongoing uh, work with that. I, yeah, I agree. That would be great to have. Can you want one or two more questions? Sure. sure. I have a question about architecture of uh, interoperation. So, Hex Data is a company which makes a data frame, uh, and they have deep learning implementation, and they try to integrate with Spark so you can basically use some other implementations. And they say, you have a good implementation already, which is proven in production, no need to implement it in the MLLib. You can delegate to that. How do you think MLLib would accommodate other libraries like Mahout, Xdata, other plans to essentially be an ensemble library, or do you want to implement all algorithms in the MLLib? Right. Yeah, so there are definitely, uh, the question is, yeah, is I guess about sort of pluggability <laughs> and, in Spark and MLLib. And yeah, there definitely are ongoing efforts for that. Um, Right now, if you wanted to say plug, you know, Mahout into MLlib, um, I don't think that there's the infrastructure to do that, you know, in a one-liner. Um, but yeah, there are definitely, it, it's a work in progress. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that you're up for contributors. It seems like we have big, big, big folks. How, how, how can I ask that? I mean, the steps are basically um, via, uh, sorry, uh, the JIRAs and via GitHub, where discussion, uh, bug reports, features uh, can be posted uh, via JIRA. And then, you know, if you have an implementation of a new feature or a fix or a test or something like that, can be submitted via GitHub in a pull request. In terms of like getting started and like why would you do it, I, I think the main reason would be if you know a particular part of uh, MLlib is useful to you personally, and you need a feature, it's not there. It would be valuable, or there's an issue with how something runs. It could be faster, um, and that would be like a great place to start. If you're just looking for like starter things, there are a number of items listed on Jira, which would be you know good to take a look at. Right. So, two questions. First was, um, 
can you contribute to JIRAs uh, for random forests? And there, there is sort of like one JIRA for random forests there, uh, basically to get the implementation in. They're discussing it um, would definitely be valuable, although right now there's a pull request on GitHub. So actually, like taking a look at the API and uh, basically the functionality there uh, would be a good start because that's sort of immediately going to get into, uh, to Spark once it's ready. Um, after that, I think there will be a lot of optimizations which could be done. And there, yeah, Jira would be a good place to start discussing. So the other question, Databricks Cloud, can you look at it and model statistics and the like? So right now, Databricks Cloud um, is sort of not generally available, available for immediate use, but you can definitely check out information about it on the Databricks website and also sign up. Uh, for beta testing, and we're uh, definitely hoping to ramp this up, and um, it would be great to um, uh, sign up and find more information, and as it is, um, you know, ready for public release, then so be, definitely be notified. So you're currently accepting beta, te beta testing? Oh, sorry. Don't let me mistake. Um, so I'm not involved with, uh, yeah, getting beta testers. Um, I know that you can sign up for beta testing on the website, and I think this is basically, um, you know, a, a good way to, like, get on the list and um, depending on your needs and uh, interactions, yeah. Uh, I, but, yeah, definitely ongoing. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I tried implementing it all last night, but wasn't able to. OK. Are there other questions? Does, does Spark support any other parallel computational matters besides MapReduce? Like, if you needed to do some kind of like, uh, asynchronous capacity gradient descent or something, <laughs> communicating between different nodes that hold different portions of the model? Right, so the question was, like, can you go beyond simple MapReduce? And um, I'd say roughly yes, in that you can submit a job, uh, have it be, start running, submit another job, so on. And um, for an, a beginner user, though, I would say that it is good to frame it in terms of some of these familiar operations because there are, is a lot of infrastructure in terms of just like API, friend, very friendly APIs, uh, for example, for doing tree aggregate. Um, but definitely as you get more advanced, for example, the graph processing uh, library sort of lets you think of data processing on a graph rather than uh, sort of this very flat MapReduce. Other questions? Okay. Let's take the speaker. Thank you.